15. It's just an absolute joy to know that you're all out there. And before we get cracking this evening, um, I want to just, you can see in, in the chat box that this has already been said, but um, if you were going to buy copies of this book for yourselves and your loved ones, and even for strangers, then you can do so at the official bookshop of the 5 by 15 organization, which is the incredible Newman Bookshop, um, a great independent bookshop worthy of your support. And this is the book, and it costs $16.99. And as you're going to discover this evening, you're basically getting a private MFA, a masterclass uh, for the cost of £16.99, pence, which is a little cheaper than I think it actually costs to go and study at Syracuse with George Saunders. So consider it an essential bargain and please buy many copies. Um, George, um, I want to uh, welcome you. To, I wish I could be saying welcome to London. And I wish we could be in the flesh, but you are um, in New York, aren't you? And you have a technical announcement to make. So do you want to make that before we get going? Yes. Yes, Max, great to be with you. Uh, yeah, I'm in my basement in or, or bunker in uh, Oneonta, New York, and uh, we're way up in the hill, so I only have satellite internet. So I'm down here because I have to be plugged into the ethernet. So all this to say, the um, usually the audio is pretty solid, but the video is a little funky. Um, so I, I'll try to be extra clever in the audio to make up for how I look, which has kind of been the story of my life so far anyway. So <laughs> apologies in advance. It's not me. It's not you. It's me. So <laughs> okay. Well, what we will do then is, is I'll try and um, leave. We'll try and avoid my usual kind of rapid fire stream of consciousness interview approach and go for a more measured thing, um, which is only fitting for such an exquisitely structured book. <laughs> um, so what I want to get you started on, because I, I know that, you know, a lot of people coming tonight will be, uh, will have read this book, uh, but perhaps we should assume the majority haven't. Um, so I want to go, I want to go, I want to start off nice and easy and get them into the spirit of the thing um, and explain. But I also want to let people know that um, a little of what my experience with this book was, um, was that I came to it as a, you know, as a fan and um, I started the book and uh, you immediately got right on my nerves um, <laughs> because you set us up with a Chekhov story and then you interrupt us. And so I started off worried that this was gonna be a strategy that would upset me. And by the end of the book, I found that I, that it was not only a beautiful, beautiful book and uh, a really interesting book, but a profoundly useful book not just to writers, but to readers and to teachers and to human beings across the board. Um, and a deadly serious book as well as being quite a funny book. But I want to I want to start, if I may, with this moment that, that so worried me, which is when you chop a Chekhov story into pieces and start interrupting us. Can you talk about how you start and why that isn't necessarily how you go on? Sure. Yeah, you know, the whole book is really kind of an attempt to do a sort of echo of the class that I've been teaching at Syracuse for 20 years. And one of the things that happens is there is usually the first couple sessions are a little pedantic. The students are a little nervous and they're analyzing like English majors uh, in a very kind of distant and theoretical way. So one of the ways to shake them off that, because the, the course is for these writers that we have who are so great. And it's all really about becoming better writers. So one of the ways to shake them off the intellectual approach is to break a story into a page at a time. Usually I use a little Hemingway story to do it. But what it does is it forces us to kind of ask that question, why do I keep reading? Like it, it, if I read a, a paragraph, I'm in a different place than I was before. Where is it? And what about that makes me want to keep going? And it's such a, it's such a basic question. It's also kind of impossible to answer except in the most um, – granular way so what i find is I'll, I'll do this exercise which is very irritating and it's irritating it's more irritating if the story is really good yeah. because you just want to get on with it but 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 forcing that pause it's almost like even if you just forced the pause and you didn't say anything just to sit there for five minutes going okay where am i now what what bowling pins are up in the air what am i wondering about why do i want to stop why do i keep want to keep going doing essentially what you did, which is say, I note that I'm irritated. 
I wonder why, you know. So that's a, it's a really useful thing. And what it does, it, it's painful, but it kind of reboots the whole semester. So for the rest of the year, it's understood that that's the way we're going to be reading, kind of, you know, in the flavor of reader response. We're just going to um, read something, react to it, trust that reaction, and then try to articulate it. So it's kind of a painful dose of medicine you have to do at the beginning to kind of have the rest of it go well. And is that mental noting that you're doing while you're reading? Is that something that you bring to all the reading you do uh, because you're someone that teaches and therefore you've, you've taught yourself to read that way? Or is this a thing you do only as a pedagogical exercise? I, th I think it's uh, it kind of depends. There's there's a I would say there's an intuitive noting that we're always doing, even if if we never articulate it. There's a you know, we like it or we don't like it. We're. Um, you know, we're ready to put the book down, we're leaning into it, or these sort of micro resistances, uh, you know, like I remember reading David Foster Wallace for the first time and feeling something mounting as he went further and further into a particular digression. That I think you feel whether you know it or not. And the, one of the things I say in the book is then the success of the work depends on what the writer does with that initial reaction. So with, in David's case, You'd be getting tense about that digression. You'd be feeling a little antsy, and suddenly he converts it into something that was totally worthwhile. You know, you put one up on the board for the writer then. Now, there's a second kind of noting that I think you do. It's the kind of noting I do in the book, and it's the kind of noting we do in the class, which is you were, are really trying to remember those reactions, yeah. I, I would say, and then articulate them. That's a slightly more formal, uh, conceptual thing. Uh, so I'm not really doing that as I'm reading. No, I'm just doing the first thing, just trying to be on the roller coaster, you know. Okay, and and and, and why then? Because these aren't necessarily your favorite stories. Um, I mean, I I I was really excited to know that you and I shared a love of Isaac Babel, and I was like, I'm going to do Babel, and you don't right till the very end. But that's that's because these stories serve a <laughs> specific purpose, right? Why have you chosen the stories you have? Yeah, I well, in the actual class, it'd be about 40, including the ones I really love, like Lady with Pet Dog and some of the Isaac Babel. But then over the course of the semester, and, and having taught it 20 years, certain stories just popped. And, you know, as I'm teaching and I look ahead at the syllabus, I'm like, oh, in the card is coming up. That's going to be great. So these are stories that just for whatever reason, sometimes because they were a little off, you know, or a little hard to like or a little defective, uh, made the best classroom discussion. So there was a kind of a last minute thing where I had the book was probably about 800 pages with all my favorites in it. And I had to make the command decision to um, pick the ones that made the most sparks uh, pedagogically, I guess, you know. Well, because kind of what, what, I, what I felt, and I, I guess a few readers would be like experiencing this as a, similarly, is that uh, maybe it's because attention is so strange at the moment and, and our kind of lived experience is so peculiar at the moment. So there's a sort of, there's already a kind of self-consciousness about this, the temporal experience of the artificial, I a, a made-up world and 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 real. And so I'm sort of I'm sort of I'm, I'm oddly sensitive to stories at the moment. I'm finding they're getting under my skin a little more than I that I'm used to. And it's obviously a good thing as a reader. This, this is what one is hungry for. Um, but also creating this sort of weirdly self-conscious or analytical mind frame in myself as a reader which is like why is that affecting me in the way it is or why have I just thrown that across the room is a, is a book I loved 10 years ago or whatever and these are all good things but 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 possibly creating an unease in me as a reader and so I began I was reading a Chekhov story which I had a, a memory of loving in fact that happened twice in this book stories I remembered loving just slightly getting on my nerves a little bit and, and I realized that it wasn't the story that was getting on my nerves it was that I was having quite a complex and combative relationship with earlier me for not having seen in the story what you are now showing me in the story. Uh, and I, it took me a while to relax into that because I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing George, I'm, I'm hearing Anton, <laughs> I'm, I'm also, I'm, I'm involved in this kind of ecosystem of empathy or frustration or, or tolerance or intolerance or whatever it is, which is the reading of the story, particularly these stories. And so I ended up thinking, God, you've chosen these, these stories are spot on because of their strange 19th century blankness and because of the odd like rapid fire way that Turgenev does people's personality or description or something. So in a way they're kind of a wonder cabinet of, of ways that stories are told, even though they appear quite slim, five writers from the same period. Right, well that was part of it too, was that I would have sometimes um, two stories that were basically accompanied by very similar essays because they're doing the same thing. So. In that case, I had to choose to boot one. And what that did was, it I mean, to my surprise, it meant that each each 
essay was kind of about a different sort of story or a different way in which one could you know relate to a story but I love what you just said and I think you know it's it's one of the wonders of teaching a class for 20 years is that they're not the same stories they're really not the same stories twice so I taught these when I was just a young guy with young kids and at all the stages along the way and they just kept morphing you know and similarly you'd have uh, groups of students who would just go I don't like Chekhov I don't want to like Chekhov uh, or other people, other groups four years later who were crazy about them. So part of the fun of it for me, teaching, is that it kind of, it, it has the effect of overturning your, your sort of ego, your academic ego, your intellectual ego, because you can't go into a class saying, here's the way it is, shut up and listen. You know, you have to say, I, I'm bringing you an object for your consideration that I think is worthy of it. Let's, let's jump in there and see what sparks fly. And especially at a program like Syracuse, where we get you know six or seven hundred people a year, and we pick six to come, so they're already off the charts. And so the so the job is not to sort of program them with the right ideas, but to give them put things in their path that cause them to be the writers that they were hopefully meant to be, uh, or, or another way of saying it is that kind of touch on the obstructions they might be having, or the kind of dynamic they might be trying to figure out. Uh, say between being funny and being serious, or whatever. So, so the job is really to kind of put explosive devices in front of them, uh, which means you're going to get a lot of pushback, which is again part of the fun if you if you approach it in the right spirit. So the book is kind of like that. It's mostly just saying, let let me cause some sparks. I hope, and then I, I was hoping that the main thing would be to elevate the short story form and say, oh yeah, this is really an incredibly beautiful, vital, and as you're saying, current form. Uh, because it's so it's so powerful, you know. I mean, you, you. It's hard for me to express really without seeming gushy how much I love this book. In as much as I, I you, you achieve that, you achieve that almost immediately. But I'd say that you do the same thing for reading, and I think you do the same thing for teaching. Like as, as an advert for, for creative writing as a discipline, it's really pretty radical because. It, it, it sets out and then undoes itself and then proves itself and then and then and then challenges itself in the same way as a student challenges a teacher. But I'd say there is also maybe we'll get onto this a little bit later. I'd say there is almost a spiritual dimension to this book as well in terms of the what it means to read what it, and and you know what it means to write. I think is bound up with that. But what it means to to come upon people that have been invented by a consciousness quite different to your own, maybe a couple of hundred years ago in a completely different country. And in this case, you know, before the, the terrible and bloodthirsty events of the 20th century, and to learn quite a lot about what it lives, what it means to live now in the 21st century from those stories. So that's sort of phenomenal achievement. Um, but what I wanted to ask you whether that whether that you therefore get that every time when you're teaching. Is that why you, you love to teach? Is because you're basically getting this kind of revisionist refresher course in, in, in literature every time you start to talk about it with these new people. No, that's exactly right. And, you know, one of the one of the, the detriments of getting older is that your sphincter tightens up, you know, your intellectual sphincter tightens up and you're, you become more and more sure that you already know everything. And so to be in front of, you know, every fall, a group of these students is to have that, you know, relax. Uh, or another a nicer way to say it is that you, you're reminded that talent springs eternal. And so, and you're also reminded that this really simple process that we're involved in, which is, you know, let's take this object made by somebody who's gone now and let's watch ourselves react to it. And then let's, let's, it's a, the process of sort of like, uh, noticing that you have those reactions and blessing those reactions. So for yeah. many years as a kind of working class person, I have a reaction and then stifle it because it can't be right because I had it. You know, I, I, I don't have the right words for it. I, and then you do this really dangerous thing, which is you, you try to override your actual reaction with one that's familiar to you, that you've heard somebody smarter than, smarter than you say. That's, you know, intellectual falsification, and it can make you a crazy person. Mm -hmm. So the idea of saying, let's have our genuine reaction, um, let's bless it, and then let's see the way that that reaction is used by the artist you know exploited you might say that that's that's actually kind of a I mean not to stress it too far but that's kind of a metaphor for what you do in every moment you know you walk into a party you feel at ill at ease now do you acknowledge that or do you de deny it seemed like a good party what's wrong with you you know no actually I'm going to acknowledge that feeling then the rest of the party is going to be kind of made out of that initial reaction 
So I think there's something about that that strikes me as being really interesting, that you can go astray at many steps along the way there. Yeah. You can, you know, you can read something with too much defensiveness. And so I, I have found the teaching, at first it was sort of just something I had to do for money so I could keep writing my books. And then every year um, it became deeper. You know, one of the things I learned was that when you're faced with a room full of strangers, um, you have some choices. I mean, you have your natural anxiety, and, your, and if you're me, your natural sense of, of not being up to the challenge. So what you can do at that point is you're involved in an active projection about those people. You know, Are they a bunch of people who hate you and find you stupid, or are they a, a bunch of friends willing to be converted and so on? So that has been something that really um, – so, so every fall you get a new group of kids, younger and younger. Um, part of you feels out of connection with them. And then this class has been a way of reminding myself that there are ways that human beings can connect, you know, across age and across class and across gender and race and everything. And one of the best ways is to mutually look at a made-up story for some, for some weird reason. And I should say, at the risk of embarrassing you, uh, the last time we saw each other was in Sydney. And you gave a keynote address that was one of the most unforgettable rhetorical uh, performances I've ever, I've ever heard. And this... It's an example of exactly what I'm talking about. There were a bunch of people in that room from all over the world. You trust you trusted them, and you 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 gave that talk in a a rhetoric that was slightly otherworldly. It wasn't the same old language that we use in everyday life, and you did that to get at some truths that can't be got at in that language. And it was a beautiful bonding success, you know. And I, and I'm holding that moment in my mind a lot now at quarantine. You know, what, what can happen in a crowd of people when the person at the front of the room trusts them? Do you think, I mean, you're really kind. Um, do you think that there is a widespread or, or possibly specific to the two literary traditions that you and I live in, as it were, the Anglo-Saxon tradition, uh, as frail and, and possibly indefensible as it is? Like, do you think that there is a, a failure of trust, um, possibly designed by or, or, or molded by the marketplace or by the way in which literature is handled as a product ultimately, but, but also which writers are guilty of, that, that is patronizing readers or, or failing to credit them with a, with a degree of actual or emotional or intelligence or, or, indeed, or indeed lived experience to bring to the story the necessary, the necessary apparatus like some of these things because you didn't teach me how to read Chekhov in this book you in a way you taught me to trust the way that I was reading him before and just give me a slightly broader set of tools mm -hmm. to do so I'm not going to now go away and read Chekhov more like George reads Chekhov I'm going to read it more like Max reads Chekhov now he knows what's possible so mm -hmm. so there's a th th that's oh, a kind that's... of crediting of me to know what to do with the toolkit you're handing do you think we have a problem with that br broadly that's a lovely thought. Thank you for it. I, I'm not sure. You know, I, I think I really that's the kind of question I I I don't I don't know. I don't know. What I do think you worry in about? I would imagine that in every generation I worry about it. Yes. And I worry about it at several different levels. When I'm trying not to worry, I say, well, it's always been thus. You know, if you drop back into 1880, there were only a handful of writers who were actually doing that uh, and they w were or were not being appreciated. I, th I think there is, um, well, I can just speak about America. Uh, and again, it's anecdotal, but I'm pretty sure about it. In my lifetime, there's been a steady devaluing of um, certain elements of the intellectual life. Uh, and mostly they have to do with reading and writing. The idea that, that literature is kind of this gauzy, you know, cute accessory that has nothing to do with the real work of the world, which is increasing shareholder value or some shit like that. So. Yes. I, just as a, as a local example, our kids went to a school, a uh, really nice school, and they had this lovely tradition of a declamation contest where the, the kids would have to memorize four or five or six or seven pages of prose, memorize it, and then deliver it. And then they got, they got prizes. Well, somebody um, complained because it was too hard for their kid. Uh, and so they just cut it. And they, they, Now, no one would ever dream of cutting the science fair or the math uh, competition. Uh, and I thought that was kind of a small, and it was just universally approved. They just cut it and nobody complained. So I think something like that has happened here for sure. And beyond that, I, I get a little bit too general and I'm not sure. 
you know, yeah. uh, but I but I love I love having the job of, of taking a group of the most talented writers in America, the young writers, and then just reminding them that they do actually have really strong opinions on the on the phrase level and, and, and that they can find those and that that's sort of a source of power. It's a, you know. I mean, I, I, I sort of I like to hear you. I was going to read from the book this this thing you said at the beginning about this community of readers worldwide and what and what a, 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 and what a radical thing it is to be part of a community that committed to expanding their horizons and and and, and refining their intelligence and stuff. And, and we can see it, as you say, I mean, in, in the I can only speak to the UK, but the kind of devaluing of literature and literacy, um, you know, in comparison to, you know, yeah, the sort of um, the world of finance or, or perpetual growth or whatever ha has is going to have a, a terrible effect on a society in the way it thinks of itself and, and what we make of one another. Yeah. Um, and also the links between literature and social justice, literacy and social justice are so explicit and so unarguable. Anyway, th these were the kind of questions that Tolstoy was wrestling with. So I think we should give the, the person at home some meat. Um, let's get into one of these stories. And, and I, I guess... I, I guess okay. what I want to get, I guess the one that I'm most tempted to get into, it's not the one I love most in the book, because you make a very good case for the Tegenev to be the story that is most wild and, and sort of joyous and surprising and random. And then the Gogol obviously comes storming, the nose comes kind of storming in like a, just a bolt from the blue. And you think, how is this possibly going to work as a story? And of course, mm -hmm. even if you read it 50 times, 60 times, it works. It's extraordinary. But if, can we do Master of Man by Tolstoy? Um, because... Sure. Your essay sure. about that is just an absolute masterclass in in explaining and unpacking, and actually almost as if you are, you know, you've got the two soloists in the sledge and you are the orchestra. You kind of give it this symphonic breadth and depth that, that wasn't there in, in my reading of it either 15 years ago or last week. And so can you just talk a little bit about, um, well, I think the thing I want to hear you talk about, because you could talk about transformational craft, what I want to hear you talk about from, as a, from a writer who, who whose work I, lo I, I love and, and I'm sometimes marvel at technically is this thing you talk about the difference between Tolstoy writing about that snowstorm in the snowstorm and then how he comes to write about it in Master and Man. And, and I, if, if I could sure. sort of coax you into, into connecting the idea of editing uh editing yourself and redrafting yourself as a writer and what that what the implications of that are for the sort of broader moral project that Tolstoy is engaged with in that story sure so Tolstoy as a young man um was on a trip and th they got stuck in a snowstorm with he's got some with some strangers and uh they ended up spending the night uh in the sled and then in the morning they found a house and they lived so being a young writer, he came home and wrote that up. And it's a, pre a pretty good story called The Snowstorm, which I think is, um, it's available on a website connected with the book. But it's a beautiful story, and it got a lot of attention at the time, and it, it helped cement his, his fame. Okay, so I think 30 years or 40 years pass, and he writes another story set in a snowstorm called Master and Man. And it's clearly um, indebted to the first story uh but it's nothing nothing like it so one of the assignments i give in the book is just read those two babies back to back it doesn't even matter which order and sit there for a minute and the the difference in those two stories is basically what tolstoy learned in those 40 years mm -hmm. all right so what is it well i kind of and i sort of say well let's just say it's it's a more highly organized system that uh, you know that's that's one idea and you know in that phrase is everything that we're trying to accomplish as artists we're trying to take our our sort of first thing and then cause it to be more highly organized what does it mean um well for first of all before we say what it means because really it's you can't reduce it it means the causality is tighter uh it means that there's less waste maybe uh it means that the thing is is more itself it's it's more universal it's not so much about the fact that once i got lost in a snowstorm but it's using the snowstorm to to frame these these greater truths that are true for everybody yeah but so then now that's great and any writer kind of knows that and the question is how do you get from the your early one to the later one you know um and for me the the kind of weird and i know it's true for you too because i've read your beautiful books th there's something weird about revising uh and the way i've come to understand it is you're giving yourself chances thousands of chances to redecide things at the at the phrase level 
Um, and I, the way I do it is I'm just reading it every day with a pen in hand and, and feeling whether I like it today or not. And if I don't, I change it. I just be a little bold in the direction of changing it. Then print it out again, just do it the next day. So the weird thing is that process uh, causes the work to be elevated. It, it, it causes it to be smarter, uh, more has more causation, uh, elevated. And weirdly, it causes it to ask better questions and it causes it to ask those questions more precisely, you know? So that's all kind of conceptual. But what I love is that I don't really have to think about that when I'm working. I, what I have to do and what I've tried to cultivate my whole life is those strong micro opinions. D do, I, do I recognize them when they appear? Uh, do I honor them? And am I fearless in honoring them or playful in, in honoring them? Um, so I, so that's, you know, it still doesn't tell us how Tolstoy did it, which I think is he just was a, you know, once in a, in a, in a century friggin' genius. But it's, for me, it's kind of comforting to say if you just work at it and if you just, just, you know, commit to making those micro decisions, then the thing will actually become more like you, I guess, eventually. Is that, is that what you're asking about? Yeah, I, yeah, I guess because to me, I mean, it, it, it isn't the Tolstoy story where you do this, but you talk in the book about reconsideration machines. You talk about the story as a reconsideration machine. And I'm very into the idea of, um, well, uh, ghosts, basically, but like, but lit literary ghosts, even syntactical ghosts or, or grammatical ghosts. And the idea of using sort of the, the, the idea that your, your previous version is haunted by your past versions. And when you're printing your new version out and you're sitting at your table and, and making it and the, the most George it can be, right? You are you are involved in a dialogue with your previous selves um, that have been brought to bear on that story in the same way as Tolstoy would be in dialogue with the snowstorm when he's writing. But that what I guess, and this is, I suppose, we're getting to the kind of meaning of the whole book, right? That that isn't what, what's required there for Tolstoy isn't technical prowess that he didn't have 30 years ago. It isn't necessarily philosophical bravery, although all this is part of it. Um, it it's something close to intuition, is it? it, it it's, it's something I, that the writer I has that is almost yeah. invisible. Yes, and the only thing I would say, because that's, I would say intuition plus iteration. You know, I think when we're young writers, we, we can believe that it's intuition. In other words, we're just going to uh, emit, you know, a, a beautiful paragraph because we're such advanced human beings. That's how I felt when I was 25, you know? So, yeah. the, um, but then I think the, the great lesson is that, yeah, you, you have to go with your intuition. And then the sort of fail safe is you get to come back to it again and again, iteratively. You're, and the, the best scale model I could come up with is that you're basically letting a bunch of different use um, act on the text, you know? So you wake up today and you're feeling confident. So you act on the text. Tomorrow you're feeling erotic, you act on the text. You know, and, and that, uh, and of course, there's a, a thousand shades of, of, this, of adjectives there. But um, the strange thing is, after a certain age for me, that process was moving in one direction. You know, I, I wasn't um, often reversing myself or not too much. So the, the iteration caused the thing to be like a big cruise ship that was slowly moving in a certain direction. Uh, and that direction was more interesting than the one I'd come at. I'd had in the, in the first place. And, and the other part of this that I found really liberating, and again, I think anytime you're talking about writing, you're not trying to come up with the answer. You're trying to liberate yourself. You're trying to make yourself, you're trying to put as much of your neuroses at bay as you can in order to be more productive. So there's no like truth in it, but there's just truth for you basically. But w what I noticed is I didn't, when I was young, I had a real thing about trying to quote unquote decide which writer I was gonna be. You know, Should I be Hemingway or Kerouac? Should I, you know? That was such a, a buzzkill. I it just froze me up. So with this new method, where you're basically your god is revision, you're not. It's not in your. Uh, it's not your job to find out what kind of writer you, to know what kind of writer you are. It's your job to find out by making these thousands of micro choices. And so in that way, it's kind of like living. I mean, when I was 19, I had an idea of the kind of guy I wanted to be, uh, and I tried to contrive being that guy, but it didn't work out. You know, life kicks you on your ass and you, you know but then now at 62 I look back and well I was a certain kind of guy mm -hmm. and I was a certain kind of guy because of those thousands of choices along the way so to me again it's, there's nothing true about this but it's just for me it's helpful if I go up and write and I I, I don't have to decide anything I don't have to have a, a 
an aspiration about the work or a, a, some idea of theme. I just have to be committed to making those choices over and over in the faith that eventually all of that stuff, theme and politics and style will come out. And do you think, because that's a heart, it's a heart business and a mind business. And it also as you, it has sort of pre-rational things involved as well as quite practical things like you write really the beautiful thing in a book about realizing you weren't, you weren't going to be a Hemingway Hill but the alternative was to be a Saunders Hill and it was just such a shitty little hill compared to the Hemingway Hill and, and, and reconciling yourself to that. So that's human work over many years and it's not necessarily to do with writing, it's to do with life, right? And, 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 and the blessings that one has to carry on or not get struck by lightning or not, or not drown in the pond when you're swimming with your friends, right? But one of the things I think is interesting about mm -hmm. you is that you're the ship, the Saunders ship, which I think was beautiful then and is beautiful now, right, is is sailing towards, mm -hmm. as dedicatedly as it ever was, towards the idea of 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 the what is interesting, uh, the, the 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 problematic stories, problematic people, problematic political currents, problematic um, you know social economic systems uh, interest you at more possibly than uh, more and more as the ship keeps yes. on sailing, right? And that and that's why these Russians are so interesting because that's what you share I, with them. Yes, I, I mean I think that's true. That that what's interesting to you is what you can make live on the page. I think that that's true. Although you know the other thing, if I was being really honest, I'd have to say um, one thing I've learned over the years finally is that I've got a particular mind that isn't necessarily me. It's just a kind of a a machine on my neck that you know that tends to think a certain way and it's thought that way since I was a little kid my early memories are in a certain tonality and that mode is pretty skeptical it's sar pretty sarcastic it likes to be funny uh, and also it, it it when I go into a situation not so much now but in my 20s and 30s I was always trying to find fault with it I, I could be funny on the subject of what's messed up about this party, you know, or what's messed up about this school. That was something that came really naturally to me. So much so that I thought that was me, that, that that's who I was. And then through writing and somewhat through meditation, had the, the kind of revelation that that was just um, a series of brain farts being produced by this particular instrument. Um, and that that could that could be altered, you know. So one of the, for me, the project of my life is to try to, uh, I don't know, I, on this simple level is to try to learn to inhabit positive phenomenon in, in as energetic a linguistic way as I do negative phenomenon, because that's only fair, you know. That's really hard. I mean, that's a really hard thing to do. But also to try to just increasingly recognize that the, the thing that I've been calling me all these years is actually just, uh, at some level, a neurological phenomenon and there are moments when you can actually step out of it and you can look at it. And I think that's what happens in this late stage revision we're talking about. Somebody, you know, in a story that I've finished, I look at it, I'm like, that's kind of smart. That's actually, th that story has, has urged me to a, a kind of a revelation I, that I couldn't have had unless I'd written the story, you know. So that to me is the exciting part. And it's, that's the part where literature starts to become about more than just literature. It's, and do you think you get better? Do you think that 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 kind of lifting out of the self, which to me is is one of the ways it's a crass thing to say, but someone the other day said, oh, uh, asked me whether I had therapy and I and I joked, no, but I, 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 I'm a writer. So it's a sort of uh, it's <laughs> a similar process and, and possibly like a similar transferences occur and stuff. And they're like, mm, no, you need a therapist, man. But uh, but what I was trying to get at was this <laughs> was this lifting out of the self that has created this document in the time it's taken to print it off. And in my case, actually welcome in as mindful a way as possible, i.e. fairly badly, the domestic into that, the political one's activism, one's worries, etc. Yes. And bring those things to bear without without trying to banish them from the room, to try and keep them in the room because they belong in the room as part of me, but whilst also achieving this kind of distance. And I guess that's what I mean about is that in, is that intuition or is it a learned, is it a learned sort of holistic how a writer comes to live because I know we're talking you know you talk in the book about the Tolstoy that wrote Alyosha the pot and left it possibly incorrectly finished or not finished as he would have done or, or somewhere in between the two Tolstoys that would have finished it differently you have there possibly the greatest Tolstoy you know because you have this somewhere in between yeah. the sub-rational or the or the accidental you have all the full fruits of this man's wisdom and skill 
almost spill rather than placed if you see what i mean and that that is just that right, that, right. that isn't no amount of practice or, or or actually no amount of teaching is going to get you there you have to do that for yourself yes i love that idea uh, uh kundera had that idea of uh, supra personal wisdom finding its way in through the work so something that we don't have access to in our daily lives somehow finds its way in through the cracks that happen during revision uh and you know i to me it's so interesting like even okay so i think editing and writing can does a lot to teach me how my mind actually works and i'll give you an example okay so my baseline idea is when we're writing or really maybe when you're doing anything with concentration the ruminating part of your mind goes quieter you know the, the kind of neurotic um inner monologue, the monkey mind that we all do, I hope we all do, uh, it gets a little quiet. And I think in, in that quiet, something else comes up. And I think there's, there's neurological evidence for this too, that basically the ruminating takes a lot of, of neural energy. When it goes quiet, there's, there's a rush of energy to other parts of the brain. Okay, so that's my baseline idea is, is I'm writing, I'm concentrating, my mind's getting quiet. That's great. And then the, the best version of that would be the mind gets very quiet and all I'm doing is reacting in real time to my text, just flipping little switches with the pen, you know. Okay, so that's a nice idea. But I know if I'm being really honest, and that's what this kind of reading is really about, admitting all, all comers. If I'm being really honest, if, I, if I'm writing something and I, I nail a paragraph, there's a little part of me somewhere in there that goes, ooh, the New Yorker is going to love that one. <laughs> and then and then you'll get to be in the magazine and there'll be an illustration, you know, just a quick, you know. So in, in a certain way, what I've learned over the years is just kind of go, OK, yeah, yeah, sure. OK, now step aside. We're going back to the story. So those little to be able to be aware of those micro fluctuations in your mind. And I guess at some level to kind of be like a smiling uncle going, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, sure, sure, sure. Now go, move on. That, that's a kind of alertness that I really love. I'm a little addicted to it, actually. Yeah. You know? and, you, and you have to let all of it in. You can't deny any energy because it takes all of our energy to do this kind of work. Yeah, like and, and what I think is so marvelous about finding out you want to write for the rest of your life, and, and possibly it's possible because you know someone wants to buy your book or whatever, is that that actually is a state you can get back to quite easily. That actually it doesn't, you know, like I yes. find, you know, blank piece of paper, headphones on, I'm, I'm there. Um, and, I, and I give gentle, like make a mental note of being very thankful that it doesn't take much work to get me back there because I'm back in an amazing place of being bombarded by language and ideas. And I'm in what we might call a flow state or blah, blah, blah. Who knows? You know, there's no need to label it. It's, it's yeah. Max versus paper. Yeah. But, he, but I think even that idea that, that there are different minds that we can enact is a really big deal. You know, the, the, the idea that the, um, we can be sort of the marshal of this grand parade in our head and go, Oh yeah, so, so I'm in that mindset now. It, in other words, the idea that you're, the mind is never fixed. You know, it's never a permanent max identity. It's just always those fluctuations, and that that's where it gets into. I think you know Buddhism and and the idea of um, uh, of everything being in an impermanent state. So so I guess just may, probably anything that you did, any practice that we did with intensity would lead to similar revelations. I think. Mm -hmm. But for me and for you, it's you know we've been sitting in that room for all those years and but also what the types of the sort of time travel the kind of the, the kind of self travel that is possible through reading and through close reading to, to enhance it like you know I, I i ran to my shelf yesterday to get my nice old constance garnet you know translation to check off down to ask myself some questions i ran to this my favorite of the russians to get to because you do this lovely appendix where you talk about translation and I sort of just started to marvel, really, at the idea of ourselves all being translated. Like, this is what you do in this book, is you send us out to live our lives, whether we're reading the Russians or not, whether we're even reading short stories. As it happens, you make a fairly good case for short stories having almost miraculous properties for, this, you know, for the self-questioning human, uh, you know, interested in their environment and interested in the problem of being alive. But you, you also, you smuggle in some extraordinary... Um, and, and very unpushy, very very straightforward lived lived experience based advice about about why why humans are so interesting, because of the type of people these writers were writing about and the type of problems they were facing, and what I love about you is that when you ask yourself the question because you never stop, you say to yourself in the penultimate chapter, what about what came after these Russians that were writing in this time, 
what does it mean that this project, this great humanitarian enterprise, this self-questioning machinery of these extraordinary artists, what does it mean that so quickly we saw humanity's absolute worst? And, and, you, and you, you save us a list of, of, of atrocities. But um, what I love about that is you just say, well, that's above my pay grade, unfortunately. Like, you're, you're, you're saying, I can't answer that. But what they do teach me and what my life as a writer teaches me is to try and answer this. And I think I found that really profoundly graceful and generous a, a, a way to behave with, with, what, with, with what you are. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. You know, I also found that that's a principle of, of fiction, too, I've noticed that if you if you can get your stories to ask a, a valid question. Um, and then if you can kind of pause at the moment where you're about to wrap things up and answer the question. That sometimes is, you know, Chekhov has this beautiful story called Lady with Pet Dog. And uh, it's a beautiful story of this, uh, these two married people who get together. And the question that hangs over the story kind of is it love yet? They're, they both got into it for sort of just f reasons of physical pleasure. And then by the end, they're, you're like, well, I think they're in love. And he takes your, and, and so we believe they're in love. We believe that they believe they're in love. They're, they're meeting in a hotel room. Uh, both of them betraying their spouses and their families. Uh, and the question is, what are they going to do about this shit? You know, are they going to break up with their husbands? Are they gonna... And Chekhov just says um, something like, you know, and they both realized that the most difficult part was just beginning. Yeah. And that's the end. And I think what the reader rises to in that is just the complete honesty of it. And, and the admission that we, as much as we like to control things, especially as Westerners, there are just moments where this life outdoes us i mean we, we we don't there is no answer and if you as soon as you cross the threshold and try to make one you're falsifying you know um sure. you know i was thinking just to go back to something we talked about i was reading these books about neurology and one of the things they're finding out is that the brain actually does work exactly like a storyteller it it um it makes a scale model of the situation that you're in uh ba based on past examples and a lot of the neural energy is used to doing that and then it just lightly um revises those with with current sensory input yeah. i think at a lower proportion than they used to think and and actually this happens from the back of your brain the back of your brain makes their first draft and then uh somehow or another as it moves forward it becomes more and more refined uh that is must have something to do with why we love reading stories so much it, it seems to mimic something that's going on really deep in our brain and it, and i would or it probably makes us better at it i would think you know the, yeah. the 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 fact of being able to recognize our first draft is is mostly projection uh, and then revise it with actual fact is a pretty pretty useful thing and to be aware of the what you call in the book the kind of mood boarding you know the raising of atmospheric effects the changing of the lights the bringing in of a major chord um to realize what the brain is doing mm -hmm. as it embellishes i just want to because i was going to get you to, we're going to take some questions but i was going to read this thing to you but i will just recommend it to our audience tonight there's a chat between you and a, a, a mutual acquaintance of ours ben marcus on the granter website from a few years ago uh it's it's about ben's anthology of american short stories and his introduction to it which is just a beautiful introduction and i would recommend people read it mm -hmm. um, but you have a great conversation and you ask him why why, uh, if we're talking about this fundamental process being kind of intuitive and subrational, then why would it help us to analyze someone else's story? Basically, why would we talk about literary lineage and stuff? And Ben says, I think, I wonder if just being in proximity to the mystery is useful, watching others wrestle with it. Mm. And I just wanted to say and, and implore people to go out and buy this book because that right now for me in living the world we're all living in has been that's exactly what I'd say it's been profoundly useful to me to watch you wrestle with Chekhov and Tegenev and Tolstoy and Gogol and it's been a joy but let, let, let's let's go to the question box thank you Max thank you um and, and can I say how much Max how much that means to me because there's nobody's work I love more than yours your 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 stuff has been so uh meaningful to me and it's restored my faith so many times in what what uh novels can do so thank you that's really kind of a man thank you Okay, let's let's ramp through this. Um, uh, I like an autonomous, uh, not sorry, autonomous. I like an autonomous attendee, but I like an anonymous attendee too. Um, what would you say to your younger writer self? Younger, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part, Max. What would you say to your younger writer self? 
Oh, uh, oh boy, I'd have a lot of harsh words for him. Uh, no, I, th I really would just say keep going because the, the, whatever I could explain to him conceptually, I know him and he would have rejected it. He just, he knew what he thought. So I think it's the, it's the magic of time, you know? Like if you think of it as uh, an individual writer has a series of obstructions, she only gets over them by working through them, you know? Yeah. And you, so we create these problems with our minds and then we solve them with our minds and unfortunately i think it's just uh, you know that ten thousand hours that malcolm gladwell talks about so i think i just tell him you know uh i mean maybe just say yeah you're on the right track you got you got crazy obnoxious energy about this shit your ego's out of control it's all you think about good job yeah, yeah right on yeah um, <laughs> yeah yeah someone called adam says i've recently reread your essay the brain dead megaphone which i cherish with so much of our recent political history illustrating your concerns about this kind of dominance of loud opinions delivered without consideration, what can literature and attention to language tell us and teach us about politics today? Hmm, thank you for that. I, I think, uh, you know, in that essay, I just made the point that when we get inflected by something, a piece of writing, we always want to consider the source and the motivation and, and the means, you know. So I think these days, what, what, what reading a story tells me is that I've got deeper registers of uh, empathy and curiosity than I mostly see in my real life. Uh, so if you would contrast reading to say social media, with reading you've got someone who spent a lot of time in this problem and hopefully as he was revising it, he was doing it with you, dear reader, in mind in order to make a more intelligent soulful complete presentation and he spent a lot of time doing that and he went deep inside himself to do it uh and he didn't really have he had some agenda he wanted you to buy it you know but but it, my experience is when you're working on it mostly your agenda is excellence you're trying to do something lovely then he gives it to you and you have time to work with it and what's really happening there is a is an occasion of mutual respect he, he doesn't even know you, but he respected you. And you, you didn't even know him, but you're giving him the benefit of the doubt. Okay, now go over to social media. Somebody is popping something out of their butt, basically, quickly, boom. The agenda is to be noticed and liked, and we know that that mostly happens by agitation. And I'm generalizing, of course. But um, it falls on you. It agitates you. It makes you uh, more inclined to make a spot judgment. It it, it encourages you to project incorrectly about other people. So I think they're really very different different things. And we can, all we can really do is choose to honor one or the other. Uh, and yeah, so I, I think it's, I, I mean, it's funny here, if you, and I've been doing it, you, know, you make the case for the short story and people kind of laugh at you a little bit. It's like, you know, it's like making the case for, for banjo concertos or something. Uh, but I think from my own experience with them, they, they really do change the way you think about the people. They, 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 cause you to think thou instead of you if you yeah. if they're good ones and i think that's something that's really worthwhile yeah 100 percent. there's a really nice question here from some no of offense to any banjo players either <laughs> they'll be in touch there's a question for someone called alan trotter who i hope is the writer alan trotter who i'd <laughs> recommend to you is an amazing you know an amazing novel um he says that uh, perhaps uh, sorry if the connection doesn't exist, but there is something about the process of constantly revisiting your writing and trusting that the process will yield results almost unavoidably that feels of a piece with Buddhist practice. Is there a similarity or relationship between the two? You kind of answered it already. It's a yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I thought that I was meditating years before I knew what it was, but just by that process of looking at a piece of prose and watching my own prose and watching what it does to me. So that's kind of a simulation of, of saying, oh, I've got a mind separate from this mind that's saying that, that's looking at something and reacting. And then I think for me, the biggest thing is that, that moment of being okay with whatever judgment the mind makes in a second. You know, uh, I, somehow I think my inclination was to override the judgment. You know, you read your story that you wrote yesterday and you're like, fuck, it's bad. No, it's not, it's perfect, it's good, it is good. That move right there is something that I, I, I associate with being a dude and being a Western dude. Um, but when I learn to say, well, yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is no good. You know, yeah. then that opens the door to saying, OK, that's all right. How could it be better? And then that that feels to me somewhat like what happens during meditation where you accept what is. And then that gives you a kind of saner basis to proceed. If that, you know. I like it. Um, there's one I really like um, here. 
do you, do you think that these stories have as much or anything to say to a group of teenagers in, for example, Wolverhampton, as they do to a group of MFA writing students? If so, what might this be? I, hmm. I mean, hmm. I, I think so. That's my that's my assumption. That's kind of why I picked them, because these are not particularly esoteric stories or or, you know, they're very simple in the language. And I think what they have to teach anybody is that the, the person out there is just as real as you are. They, they really are. It doesn't seem that way to us, of course, because we're the star of the movie. But, but that person over there, even if she appears to be somebody beneath you or different from you or superior to you, she's actually having uh, an experience mentally, internally, that's analogous to you. That, that's a huge thing. And I think one of the ways that these stories does that is it just picks you up and puts you in that person's head. So you start reading In the Cart, and there's a kind of overworked, tired, middle-aged person who might, you might just, if you saw her at the bus station, you wouldn't even look at her. Well, Chekhov turns us into her for, for 10 pages. And uh, I think after that, you know, the, the possibility exists that you would see that person. So I, I don't think, I think that's the, the dream, you know, is that yeah. the story would speak to everybody because really we are all kind of in the same boat. You know. Yeah, and Mark. You know, what do you think, Max? Well, yeah, a hundred percent. And not only should, not only does it have something to say to those teenagers, it absolutely must be brought to those teenagers, um, and carefully unpacked in the way that George carefully unpacks it for us. And that is the miracle of teaching, but it's also the responsibility of the literary community to do that, not just to speak about it with their yeah. with their close students or their editors, but but to go out into the world. With, with these questions and, and with these methodologies in a way. Like, I think it's, your question is more or less my entire mission statement as a literary professional, to be honest. Um, and you know, next part, of, can I say one more thing about that? Yeah. The part, um, when I was first, because I would say part of the job as teaching is to have the faith that those kids will get it. They might reject it at first. They might, it might seem strange to them, but to have, what they really love is when the teacher has confidence that they can, they can find it. Like that old joke about the art museum, you know, the guard says to the person, Madam, the paintings are not the thing being judged here. You know, that. So when I was first starting to teach, I had one really tough group of freshmen. They didn't want to be there and they could tell that I was a beginner. And I went to a colleague and he said, I have a trick for you. He said, uh, when you look at that group of 19 year olds, try to imagine them as the 40 year olds they will someday become. What do you mean? He said, well, right now they're beautiful, they're healthy, they're arrogant, you know, they don't want to be here. But in another 20 years, they're going to have a mortgage, they're going to have kids, they're going to have marriages of various difficulties. They're, you know, that person is the one who needs these stories. So you're doing that 40 year old a favor by seeding in uh, a love for these, for this work, and also for the, the confidence that, the, yes, these are intended for you. And I took that advice and it worked like a charm. I went in the next day and I just saw a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of forty year olds, you know, looking at me. <laughs> uh, I went, I was doing a thing with some young men, a mentorship scheme recently with young people, and uh, I walked in all over my big box of books I was going to give them, and I was like bounded in, and one of them just turned around and went, "Oh, I mean, I can't swear, but this is the C bomb we're talking about here." She went, "Oh, you must be book guy." <laughs> so that's my new nickname, oh, book yeah. C guy. Um, yeah, yeah she's damn right I was. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so listen, this is a nice question that I'm, I'm going to choose to ask because um, I find it romantic. Um, it's from Derek. My wife and I are in lockdown. I'm thinking of buying your book and sharing it with my wife, reading a bit each day. Would you recommend we read a section together and discuss it or read the section separately and then discuss it or what? Hmm. First of all, it helps if you have nine separate copies. That's been shown to be really helpful for the whole for the process. I don't, I don't know why, but no, I, I think I would. Um, I'll tell you what I, what you might do. This is this is involved does involve actually a little more money. But there's an audio book um, that Random House did beautifully read. So you could, you know, buy it, listen to the stories, listen to a great actor reading the story, then have a few days of talking about it or a day or whatever, an hour, and then read the essay. That might be the best. Or maybe one of you could read the story aloud. And then just sit with it for a little bit and then and then discuss it and then read the essay because i think it's good you know what we do at syracuse is uh i assign the stories on a thursday they all go off and read all week and they talk about it among themselves i'm sure uh and then we come in so they're ripe with having just read it uh and they have their interpretations and i made them write about it so then 
it's best for the discussion to happen then where they're already really ripe with it and they have theories and stuff. But that's a lovely thing to do. I hope, I hope you do it. I love the idea that, that Derek might read the story and then Derek's wife will just pepper Derek with possibly even in your act, in your, in your doing an impression of you, George. <laughs> a little, a little, <laughs> oh, please no. <laughs> um, there's a question here. It was raining and it was snowing in Russia and they were in a snowstorm. I got, you got to do it with the Chicago accent. <laughs> I'm a nice dude. You're a nice girl. Okay. Um, Dan says, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the things I loved most about the book was the gentleness of the Russian writers when dealing with supposedly silly people. Could you talk a little about the idea of generosity and being kind? I like this question. Yeah. Well, in, in, a, in a writerly sense, I think um, the, for me, the, the, the trajectory usually goes in an early draft, I'm not that kind to a character, which is to say I'm not fully considering him or her. I, she's just a device, you know. Um, so that's often the first movement of a story is to make a kind of caricatured, cartoonish, slightly pejorative picture of somebody. And then I think the story form has at its core that reconsideration. You, you start off by saying somebody is low, and as you're rewriting it, and then, of course, as the reader is reading the final product, that estimation comes up a little bit. And in many stories, and many of Chekhov's stories, that's actually the whole motion, you know, to take somebody that we might have overlooked and then just through attention uh, elevate her to, to, a, to a higher level. Um, so kindness, you know, I, I did a speech on kindness that has come back to haunt me over the years because it, it went viral, and now I'm like the, the kindness guy. <laughs> Um, which is a drag when you're, when, you're, when you're about to rob a bank. It's really a, tough. But I think, I think the main thing is if, if in the thinking I've done about it since, you know, in the American argot, kindness means niceness. You're always nice. Well, we all know from real life that that's actually not kindness. That's just checking out. You know, you're just, you just, you're auto kind. Um, so I always talk about that idea. If you went into a, <clears throat> a, a coffee shop and the, the barista was crying, had just been crying, and you had made the resolution to be kind, what do you do? And actually, it's you can't answer it based on the information I just gave you. There's not enough information to know what the kind thing to do would be. What, what would be the thing that would benefit that person? So then kindness leads into other subrooms, which like in that case, awareness. You'd have to be really alert to what was actually going on in that moment. You'd also have to be really alert to your own preset. Like for me, I've got a little messiah complex. So for me not to intervene is going to be difficult. That's a defect, you know. So I think kindness leads to so many other virtues. And in the fictive realm, it's, I think it's really, really related to honesty. Meaning, are you representing people truthfully or are you manipulating them for dramatic effect? And more importantly, is your story responding honestly to the things that's put in motion? That, that I think is where we really feel what we call compassion or kindness is when the writer has basically just said, okay, I'm going to accept every ramification of the situation that I've created and I'm trusting you, dear reader, and I'm trusting me to be okay with that. Yeah. I think that's that's what feels like kindness to me. Like in a story like The Darling, Chekhov just says, I, we're going to say everything true about this lady. And in the end, I trust that that's going to leave you in an elevated position as a reader. Yeah. Something like that. And that kindness requires a kind of exactitude. But then it's funny because you... you... Yes, yes. But then, you, then it's interesting, you know, to have a thought like that and go, okay, fine, Mr. Mr. Khalil LeBron, but what about um, Flannery O'Connor, you know? What about Confederacy of Dunces? And then I think then exactitude is the right thing. Flannery O'Connor is always precise. She's always exact, and she's always fearless about showing the way people actually are, and that, I think, is a high form of kindness, right? Exactly. It, it might, might even be devoid from a contemporary moral, contemporary architecture of morality like the, the kindness is is something that, that can yes. travel in time as much as as much as pity or um, listen we've got we've got to finish but i want to ask one more question because yes. just mm -hmm. to big up everyone the questions in this box are just incredible you've had so many great questions george which i really think is is because you you inspire such good and generous and gentle thought but um I, let's get some names let's spit some names into the crowd um, someone, Mike says, if you were to write a book, mm -hmm. but using contemporary short stories, whether or not you would or not, which stories would you choose? So can you, can you just give us some contemporary short story writers that you love and think are interesting? Yeah. Actually, you don't even need to love yeah, them. Yeah. And just if you allow me to define contemporary. Yeah, right. They just work. If I, if I could define contemporary a little broadly, the one, uh, there's a great under, sort of 
lesser known story by a writer named Gina Berrialt. Gina Berrialt. Uh, it's called The Stone Boy, which is just a flat out beautiful story, but it also teaches really, really well. Um, I would teach uh, Zora Neale Hurston's, um, oh, uh, it's got the word five bit in it. Or it's, uh, the, it's got, it's, I can't remember the name now, the, the something six bit. That's a beautiful story to teach. Uh, there's one by Richard Yates called, um, in terrible title. It's like, it's got Dr. Jekyll in the, in the title. Um, sorry. And I would also teach, um, let's see, what would, give me some name next. What would you teach? I would teach something by, the, Rebecca Curtis has um, a, a story with the word, word Christmas in it that's really amazing to teach. What I you, think I, you know that anthology Ben did? Um, I think, you know, Rachel B. Glazer, Jesse Ball. Um, there's some great writers in there. Um, Yi Yun Lee. Um, I think I, I, I'd, I'd maybe take that to my Desert Island book and it would give me a lot to think about America now. Um, not that that's necessarily yeah, yeah. The, the imperative of an anthology, but it, but it, it had that effect on me. Uh, you know, represent the sort of representational... I would teach the... Stuff. Go on, no, I'm sorry, I, I got a delay, so I'm interrupting. I'm sorry. I, I, I would teach Bullet in the Brain by Tobias Wolf and a couple of Grace Paley things and a story called Carried Away by Alice Munro, I think. It's kind of a fun... The, the, these uh, When I've taught the American short story, it, that class isn't as good as the Russian one. I think just because of my limitations. But the, the Russians are the ones that teach, for me, they teach better than the American. They yield. Right, well, listen, we've gone on four minutes. I'm just going to put the jacket on my book because I had previously drawn a naked man on here singing. <laughs> and I'm just going to hold it up so that people can leave <laughs> Um, it would be cool if you bought this from the Newham Bookshop, but it's great if you buy it from anywhere or listen to the audio book and read your way back into George's work and then read your way sideways. Go grab, go grab the check off the shelf. It's changed. You've changed. George, it's been such a pleasure. Lots of love to you and thank you for this. Man. Thank you all for these great questions. Man, thank you so much, man.